Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly introduce you to each of the four speakers, then I'll kick off with my talk. So, first of all, Shlomo Bonazzi, University of California, Los Angeles. Shlomo is a behavioral economist interested in combining the insights of psychology and economics to solve big societal problems. He received a PhD from Cornell University's Johnson Graduate School of Management and is currently a professor and co-chair of the behavioral decision-making group at UCLA Anderson School of Management. Along with Richard Thaler, who we saw earlier, uh, he pioneered the Save More Tomorrow program, which is a behavioral prescription designed to help employees increase their saving rates gradually over time. Shlomo has also advised government agencies in the US and abroad, and has worked with many financial institutions, and he currently serves as an academic advisor and chief behavioral economist for Alliance Global Investor Centers for Behavioral Finance. His current focus is in online behavior, which is fascinating. He'll also be signing some very exciting books later, so catch that. And the goal is to improve online decision-making by designing more effective information and choice architectures. Shlomo is currently at work uh, on this book. It's called The Smarter Screen, and uh, it's going to be published by Penguin Portfolio later this year, so get in nice and early. So that's Shlomo. Next up, we're going to have Johannes Eichstätt, and he is a research scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and he's a candidate in psychology under Martin Seligman, who I'm sure some of you will have heard of. He's a former physicist and received an MS in the physical sciences with a concentration in particle physics from the University of Chicago with two masters in psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. This is a very illustrious panel. And in 2011, he founded and led the World Wellbeing Project, uh, which is pioneering method methods to measure the psychological states of large populations using social media Text, text mining and machine learning. This work has resulted in millions of dollars of grant funding and set a high profile publications which have received media attention around the world. He was elected in 2014 as the emerging leader in science and society by the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has served as an expert for the United Nations to advise on the society-wide measurement of well-being. Are you all still with me? Yes, okay, one more to go. So Hal Varian is our illustrious final speaker. He's a chief economist at Google. Um, and he started in May 2002 as a consultant and has been involved in many aspects of the company, including auction design, econometric analysis, finance, corporate strategy, and public policy. He's also an emeritus professor at the University of California, Berkeley, in three departments, business, economics, and information management. He received his SB degree from MIT in 1969 and his MA in mathematics and a PhD in economics from UC Berkeley in 1973. He's also taught at MIT, at Stanford, at Oxford, at Michigan, and other universities around the world. Hal is a fellow of the Guggenheim Foundation, the Econometric Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was also the co-editor of the American Economic Review from 1987 to 1990 and holds honorary doctorates from the University of Ulu, Finland, and the University of Karlsruhe, Germany. He has also published numerous papers in economic theory, industrial organization, financial economics, econometrics, and information economics. Uh, and he's the co-author of a best-selling book on business strategy called Information Rules, a strategic guide to the network economy, and wrote a monthly column for the New York Times 2000 to 2007. You're not going to be tested on that, so don't worry. Um, OK, so I will dive straight in. So I have 14 minutes. So my speciality is the psychology of online persuasion. If you want to download the slides, this is going to be very rapid. You can get all the references here, bit.ly forward slash bx2015 underscore persuasion. If you're on Twitter, I will tweet out, tweet out, I'll tweet out this link a bit later. Right, so quick introduction. That's me. You can tweet to me at Natalina Hi, and I help companies to apply scientific rigor to their e-commerce platforms and to content marketing. In 2011, I coined this term web psychology and defined it as the empirical study of how our online environments influence our attitudes and behaviors. So that can be anything from websites, apps, email, it can be wearable technology. And the reason I decided to come up with a new term was because I wanted to have a number, an umbrella term, a convergence point, to sort of gather all of the insights from all these disparate fields of study, each of which can give us specific understandings of how and why we behave online the way that we do. So things like personality psychology, how does your personality influence your interaction? Things like human-computer interaction, um, neuroaesthetics, how we respond to visual stimuli at a brain activity level, behavioral economics, and the list kind of moves on. But today I want to start off, not with loads of academia, but with a quick quiz. So by show of hands, do you ever feel preoccupied with the internet? Hands up if that's a yes. OK, 
Okay, so most of us try normal. Do you ever feel restless, moody, depressed, or irritable when, if you're brave enough, you attempt to cut down? Okay, the rest of us are like, no, pff, attempt to cut down? What are you talking about? Uh, do you ever stay online longer than you originally intended? Facebook, <laughs> that's everybody. Um, have you ever lied? To that's not me. I mean, it might as well be, because you all nip to the loo to sort of, just going to check my phone. Uh, have you ever lied to family and friends to conceal the extent, you're laughing because it's true, um, of your internet use? Hands up if, oh, that's kind of me. <clears throat> right. And finally, do you ever use the internet as a way of escaping from problems or what psychologists call relieving a dysphoric mood? So that's feelings of helplessness or guilt or anxiety or feeling a bit depressed. Okay, so I know that at some point over the last couple of years, I've had my hand up for every single one of these things. And the reason that we've all had these experiences is because we're being persuaded all of the time by the technology that surrounds us for various different ends. And I want to talk a little bit today, a little taster of three of these hidden persuasers that we encounter in our day-to-day -day life. So the first looks at hedonic adaptation hacks. Now, how many of you downloaded this when it came out? Angry Birds? Okay, oh, not as many as I thought. Right, so really exciting. And Angry Birds comes out, and you're like, oh my god, what's this? It's really exciting, it's really new. Your engagement levels, your excitement levels, and your arousal levels are high. It's new, you get on it, all your friends are doing it. You pass all the levels. Eventually, your engagement and arousal levels drop. So what do they do? They bring out the next one. Oh my god, everyone's doing this new one. It's called Angry Birds Space. Your arousal levels heighten, you play the game, and then eventually your in sort of interaction with it drops. So they do another one and another, and you start to see this curve, right? And this sort of spiking curve is a way of reducing people's response. And the hedonic adaptation response is when we become accustomed to a positive, so excitement, or a negative stimulus. And the emotional effects of that, of feeling good or feeling bad, start to attenuate over time, so it diminishes over time. So we become desensitized or bored of the same thing over and over again. So in an online context, this can be features, concepts, rewards, it can be relationships. And what's interesting is that the tech that we have around us, especially when we look at apps or we look at content strategies, um, they're trying to get us out of this normal hedonic curve into one where we're in this upper quadrant of arousal and activity. So when you're going through your different games and they send you an update and you think, oh, I'll just check it out, this is why you're incentivized, in part, to check it out. The second principle I want to look at is endowed progress. So, a couple of researchers randomly distributed 300 loyalty cards to people at the car wash. So you guys over here, you get this card. You get a card that says if you get eight stamps, we're going to give you a free one. You guys over here, you get the 10 stamp category. But if you've got these 10 stamps, you can get a free car wash. And look, we've been really sweet with you. We've punched these two first. So the question is, which group you guys with the eight, or you guys with the 10, got the highest redemption rates. Who thinks it was the eight stamp category? Oh, you're too smart for your own good. And the 10 stamp category, right, of course. Why? Well, because, oh no, I'll come to the why in a sec. So actually, you did find that this is exactly what, what happened. So 19% of the people in the eight stamp came back, redeemed the loyalty card. 34%, nearly twice as much, in the 10 stamp category, came back to redeem their loyalty cards. And the reason for this, is that despite objectively the fact that these both, both of these conditions only have eight tasks or eight steps to complete, one of them was reframed because two of them were, were completed already. So you get this sense of the 10-step task having been already undertaken, you've already got those two punches, and so it's incomplete. So you think, oh, I've really got to finish this task. Except most of this isn't happening consciously. So people provided with this kind of artificial enhancement or advancement towards a goal will exhibit a greater persistence towards finishing it. So this is an online, uh, an offline example. It also works online, as you might expect. This is a friend of mine. He runs Silicon Reel, um, which is basically a website that looks at TV videos, uh, with, well, videos with people in the tech scene. If you're on the page for long enough, this pop-up comes up, and you'll see that it's not any ordinary pop-up. There's a progress bar. Now, you have not had to do anything to interact with this pop-up apart from land on the site. And yet, it says, 50% complete. Almost there, complete this form and click on the button below to gain instant access. So it's this sense of endowed progress. You haven't had to do anything. And yet, because they've artificially advanced you towards completing it, you feel more of an inclination to doing it. And so the conversion rates increase. OK, arousal and social validation. Now, I'm being sneaky here because I'm sort of sticking two uh, principles together because you often find them online together. The first, arousal, I want to give a specific example. So. Um, We've all had this experience when you go online, I don't know, the Twitter scroll, which we're going to look at in a sec. 
where you're looking for that hit, you're looking for that sense of reward. Has someone tweeted me? Or it's the game we play every morning when you wake up blearily and you look at your emails, you think, oh, have I got that one amazing promotion email uh, where I'm going to get to become the CEO or something. And the point is, every time we get any of these kinds of rewards, you get a dopamine hit. And this is dubbed as the reward neurochemical in the brain. And we're after these hits all the time. And so what you'll find is that apps will engage the system, give you tiny rewards. You don't know when they're going to come or how big they're going to be. It's called a variable ratio of reinforcement. And so you keep playing the game. You'll often find that this comes in parallel with social validation, which is our desire to be liked and admired and included by our peers. So Tinder, perfect. Arousal, you don't know when you're going to get a match. This is really exciting. I could be getting laid tonight or going on a hot date. And if I get a match, I get that social validation. Someone wants that with me too. That's, that's great. You also get it in the infinite Twitter scroll. I might get a nice tweet. I might not. I'll keep going until I find that reward. And if I get one little reward, maybe there's another. You also get it on Facebook. In fact, one of the fundamental principles that has allowed Facebook to become so successful is this sense of social validation with a simple like button. Everyone wants to get liked. OK, so we're constantly being bombarded. And I want to ask the question, are we addicted? Now, this is a very loaded term. So before I hear these utterances of, oh, that's a very loaded term. How can she use that? Let me just say that the five items that I gave you at the very beginning were taken from the eight-item diagnostic questionnaire for internet addiction. Now, when do you think it came out? Early 1990s? Mid-1990s? Guessing no there. 2000, anyone think 2000? And no one wants to answer. 2005, most of you are like, I'm not going to play this game. Well, it came out before Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp. It came out in 1998. This is years before any of these really addictive technologies came into the fore. And what's interesting is that the research is coming in thick and fast. Research last year that was conducted by Yahoo found that for our mobiles, which is our primary interface with the web when we're not at work, we tend to use apps. Well, it's 90% of our internet use is through apps, and only 10% through browsers. So these apps are designed to be persuasive with these techniques. And what you're finding is, is that the top times when we're using these apps is when we're either alone and by ourselves, when we're bored or killing time, or while we're waiting for something or someone. It's the downtime, when we feel perhaps disconnected, or less aroused, or less excited. But this is having some sort of unseen impact on our well-being for good and for bad. The first I want to briefly look at is moods. So There's interesting looks at Facebook research. People who spend a lot of time come off, and typically, the mood will have dropped. Also, you find when people are suffering from greater feelings of anxiety and depression, they'll go on and end up having an even more dysphoric mood when they come off. Fear of missing out, the new thing. Also, relationships. You can't have a clean break anymore. Facebook jealousy is causing all sorts of havoc, as well as other platforms. I don't want to just pick on Facebook. Also, constantly having an external trigger we found, uh, researchers found that if you have your phone on a table, even in phone stacking, which is what they do in the States, some people would say, right, stack all your phones in the middle, the first person who gets a text or a call buys around. Well, that doesn't really solve the problem because just having that external trigger of the phone on the table lowers the quality of conversation and the emotional depth with which you interact with your peers. So that's another issue. Also, research done with kids on a five-day wilderness break found that compared to the beginning of the break, when they've been heavily using technology, at the end, they found that they're much better at reading social and emotional cues. So it, it, it's kind of implying that there are certain costs that we're paying when we're continuously involved with our technology. And there's also some interesting research around its impact on sex life and disruptive checking habits, but we don't have time now. Um, but there is growing media attention and pushback against some of these more negative aspects of the influence that tech is having on our lives. The first, people are downloading blackout productivity apps, such as Freedom. Great, it stops you from having to log into all your sites because it blocks them. You've got Stay Focused, and one that I use, Rescue Time, which shows you exactly, if you're brave, exactly where you've been spending all your time at work that week. Don't show this to your boss. You also have Blackout Vacations in California, Camp Grounded, no tech allowed. And also, Tracker and Ad Blocking software. These two I use, I highly recommend. Ghostery, it will block all the analytics platforms and third-party applications trying to get hold of your data when you're on these sites. It will also list on your competitor sites what uh, tracker software that they're using so that you can then see if you can get a competitive advantage. Uh, also, Adblock, which is really good, strips out all the ads in your web experience so that you have much more distraction-free internet time. So where does this leave us? Quite breathless at this point. Um, as designers, how many designers? Do you have any designers in the room? OK, a couple of designers. So for those of us who are designers, we have to decide whether and in what way to use these ethically in our product design. So what does that mean, and in what context does that change? And then for the rest of us as customers, how do we ever, well, we've got to figure out how to educate ourselves 
so that we understand how we're being influenced and we can then choose consciously which companies and devices and products to trust based on their merits. And the point here is that when I talk to designers and customers, there's this idea of the customer being the end user, something abstract, something disparate, something other than us. But the point is that we are all the users. And so when we're looking at how our technology is influencing our lives, what I like to think of is this sort of persuasion continuum. You can use behavioral science practices to help facilitate people for mutual benefit for your customers and for yourself, or you can use it negatively with the benefit of the business in mind solely to coerce people into particular outcomes that don't serve or empower them and their goals. So as individuals, designers, and developers, I think it's up to us, because we're the architects and users of our future tech, to decide what kind of world we want to build. So here are all my references. Um, you can tweet to me if you're too shy to ask any questions. That's a copy of the book if you're interested in checking it out. And if you're interested in how our technology is influencing us, this is a nonprofit event I run every year called Humanize the Web. I will now pass over to our next speaker. And I think you owe me a drink afterwards because you had a bet that I couldn't go through it. So uh, we now have Shlomo Bonazzi. Welcome to the stage, Shlomo. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about the book, The Smarter Screen, and it's really about trying to use digital technology to help people uh, make better decisions. A bit of background. Um, I'm not a technologist. I know nothing about technology. Most likely, by the time I'm done with my 14 minutes, some technology will break just because I'm around. Um, I have experience with that. Um, <clears throat> I, I started my career really more on the offline traditional behavioral economics. Uh, and the first point I'd like to make in my journey over the last 25 years is behavioral economics could be extremely powerful. We have the potential to affect millions of people. And in one case, it was actually done, hopefully in many more cases going forward. So this is uh, an area I'm very familiar with, pensions and savings, and this is a program that some of you might have heard with, so I'll be very quick. How many have heard of Save More Tomorrow? So I'll be really quick. Um, so that's a program uh, that Richard Taylor and I worked on since 96. So it took a long time, so I'm gonna talk a lot today about speed. How could we do um, <clears throat> a lot more nudging a lot faster? But um, since most of you are familiar with it, then this is the first company back in 98 where we actually try to help people save, but not today, tomorrow. And there were a couple of behavioral insights, like it's so much easier to imagine ourselves doing the right things in the future. How many of you are going to have a great meal tonight and dessert and wine and maybe tomorrow start a diet? Why? <laughs> So, so there were some basic behavioral principles that made it very powerful. The best estimate we have today is that we doubled the saving rates of six million Americans and increased, it had an impact on national saving rates. Um, but we really failed, if you think about it, seriously. There are 100 million people in the US who probably saved too little. We affected six million, and it took us 15 years. I'm not starting any project today that would take 15 years, okay? So we need speed, and we need scale. And that brings me to the digital space. That's the obvious candidate to give us scale and speed. Uh, this is Senator De Leon, who's been uh, kind enough to teach with me at UCLA on occasion. And we have this little formula from one of the classes. If you have powerful behavioral insights and you have the scale and speed of mobile technology and you're willing to try, fail, adjust, learn, then you can actually solve big societal challenges. And at this point, I think all you need is a couple of academics and a couple of kids in Silicon Valley and you solve all the problems and we're done. <laughs> Other than one little problem and that's what the book is about that we have to figure out, first of all, are there any differences between the behavioral patterns that people exhibit online and offline? And if they are, 
what are they, what are the challenges, and what are the opportunities. And I'm not going to try and tell you that our digital mind is extremely different from how we behaved 10 years ago. It's not going to be reasonable to think that we changed like that. But there would be <clears throat> certain features of the environment that would make certain behavioral patterns a lot more dominant. And we have to think about the downside and the upside that comes with it. So I thought, given that I have left nine minutes, um, <clears throat> I thought about five observations um, that I found interesting. <clears throat> and these have to do with kind of differences between online and offline. And each one of these would have a challenge and downside and would have some opportunities. The anonymous screen. How many of you have seen iPads in restaurants, uh, probably at airports, to order food? <clears throat> so we eat more when we order on touch screens. Because it's OK to ask for the double, double, extra large, super large pizza <clears throat> with extra ham and chocolate and strawberries. <laughs> so two things happen. Because the screen is anonymous, we can actually admit that we like chocolate with ham and strawberries. That's actually a good thing. We get what we want. But the other thing, we're also comfortable ordering way too much food. And now you could virtually write a book about doom and gloom and how the internet is going to destroy our life and about our kids. And, uh, but actually, it has a lot of upside. So think about <clears throat> doctors trying to figure out uh, which one of their patients is drinking too much. Big problem in the UK. You can't treat something unless you're aware of it. If you actually give people, patients, iPads in the waiting room, they're a lot more likely to admit all of their misbehaviors, to use a term that Taylor lately uh, likes. So all of these five behavioral patterns I'm going to talk about that are either unique to digital displays or are just more prominent, they would have some downside, but they would also have a lot of upside. Teenagers who are planning to commit suicide, what do they do nowadays? How do they get help? They place a post on Facebook. Seriously, happened to a friend of mine. <clears throat> His daughter wouldn't talk to her parents. She wouldn't talk to the best friends. She wouldn't talk to anyone, but the screen is anonymous. So she could actually go to the screen and say, I'm planning to commit suicide, and this is exactly how I'm going to do it. Now, it's quite funny, right? She smiled. She knows everyone would see it. She knows help will get. But for some reason, it's an easier way to do it. And obviously, that highlights my point that, yes, we might eat a bigger pizza, but we might actually save some teenagers as well. So there's a lot of upside. Uh, digital reading gap. There's now a lot of evidence that people don't learn well on digital displays. And it's got all sorts of reasons. One of them, it's easy to read really fast, so you don't have to process anything. Some of those who are in the ebook business, they create new type of fonts, so you could read even faster, which means you're not going to remember anything. Uh, in classrooms, where you get a lot of computers to uh, enter the classrooms, you, um, when people have actually computers, they can type their notes. They could do it really fast. So they literally dictate the entire lecture. They don't have to process. They don't have to think. With pen and paper, we have to slow down because we don't write that fast. So we have to now summarize. We have to process the information. We remember a lot more. <coughs> we learn a lot more. Now, some of the research by Danny Oppenheimer and others find that there are ways to slow down people. So they will process the information. You could use all sorts of ways to slow the mind, including ugly fonts that are harder to read, which is exactly the opposite of what you see in digital design. Now, there's a unique advantage to doing it on screens. 
Because if you were to introduce a book with some ugly font, by the middle of the book, people get used to it. Those ugly fonts are not ugly anymore, and now they can read really fast. But if they're on their ebook, we could figure out that they're starting to read too fast. We can find a new font <laughs> that they're not used to. So you could really figure out ways to slow the mind and let people learn more. Visual biases. It's not a new phenomenon. that obviously works offline as well as online. But I think that the more um, visual the, the medium of interaction, the more prominent it would be, especially when you kind of have a contained uh, set of, of pixels. Um, as a side point, we have very little research in all of these domains. We definitely need a lot more. Um, <clears throat> But in one study, they find that actually I can convince people who like uh, chocolates to pick strawberries or something else by simply picking the item I want them to pick in the middle of the screen. Depending on how you organize the screen, if you have a three by three metric, then the middle of the screen would be the hot spot. And there are very, various ways to actually change it, but that's kind of a very basic one that the hot spot is in the middle of the screen. And that's obviously a problem if someone wants to sell you something that you don't want to buy. But if you're thinking about healthcare.gov, Obamacare, or if you're thinking about the pension freedom in the UK and you're organizing an exchange to help people choose health insurance or an annuity product for their pension, you now have the tools <clears throat> so that they will be more likely to buy the products that you think make more sense if you place them in the right place on the screen. Touch screens. So this is a study that was done on laptops that are not touch screens and laptops that are also tablets and you can touch. So they're kind of the same, other than the fact that you could touch one of them. Turns out that when women pick jewelry, they're actually valuing the jewelry 40% more. So these are not small magnitude. 40% more on a touch screen. They can touch it. If you think about the endowment effect, this is not very different in spirit. <clears throat> so you can imagine now how Tiffany uh, would start having different prices. There is actually a huge company selling now diamonds online, uh, Blue Nile. They're humongous. And you can imagine that now they know you're coming on a touch screen. They know you actually touched it. They know you zoomed in. That actually makes a difference too. So they're going to now have a different price for you for this diamond. But if you think about CVS, and they have a lot of health initiatives, including trying to help people use e-cigarettes and quit smoking, they can actually decide about the pricing on different devices to optimize, actually, the amount, the quantity of e-cigarettes that they actually get people to buy and try. Last point, size matters a lot when it comes to digital displays. So <clears throat> in one study that uh, I've done with John Payne of Duke, we ask people basic financial literacy questions like, Inflation is 2%, your pay raise is 1%, can you buy more or less than last year? Very basic questions. People cannot answer it on small devices, but as you move to bigger screens and pen and paper, they can actually answer it. And this is very preliminary, but there's more research that I've seen that actually people are more emotional on the small devices. Now, think about it. What if you now <clears throat> are setting the Pension Freedom Act in the UK, and people can now cash out their accounts? They can go to the mall. Would you like them to have a one-click app where they can cash the entire pension from the last 20 years? It goes automatically to their Apple Pay account, and they can just go and tap their watch and buy whatever they want. Now, that's what's happening out there. That's the downside. We're actually seeing the, you see, you can just ignore the timer. Um, <laughs> it's a digital device, I can tell it, right? Um, 
we're seeing out there a competition among financial institutions who would have the first Apple Watch app for 401k plans in the US. I, I don't understand why we even need it. But now think about people making those impulsive decisions just because you have a one-touch app to cash out your pension. I'm running out of time, so let me make last point. The fact that those screens are small comes with a huge advantage. You could give people what John Lynch might call just-in-time financial information because you can have the phone with you. So we did a study. I did a study with your own levy at UCLA. We gave people a snapshot of their finances, in particular what they spend versus their budget. We noticed that people actually check it while they're at the mall. Savings went up, spending went down by 16 percentage point for the three months of the experiment. These are huge. So there's lots of opportunities to give the right information at the right time to make a real uh, change. Okay, I ran out of time. I can ignore my iPhone, but not our lovely host. Um, so I will stop. Uh, so thank you for that very fascinating, quite long three-slide presentation, Shlomo. Uh, next up, we have Johannes Eichstedt to take the stage. So welcome, Johannes. Uh, thank you, everyone. The, the first thing I need to tell you is a bit of a disclaimer. There are curse words in this presentation because we study real people in the real world. So if you're eight, um, it's a great moment to leave the room. Um, <laughs> I don't know where you were on the 19th of February in 2009, um, but some of us woke up to this paper being published in Nature. This was a group of people at Google um, tracking flu using the internet. And what they'd basically done is create a real-time measurement tool for flu across the US, both space and time. Um, and here is what the data looked like. So the, these are flu rates. The black dot is Google. The red dot is the Centers for Disease Control. You see two things. The first thing that you see is that they track really, really well. The correlation coefficients are in the high 90s. It's a very, very close fit. Um, if it was any higher, you'd worry that the data isn't true. Um, the other thing you see is that the black dot is about a week and a half ahead of the red dot. So you have a perfect, essentially, with some exceptions, reporting tool for the flu with no reporting lag that doesn't cost much money. So what they've basically done is go from reporting up from hospitals to listening into the traffic in data centers to provide a societal amenity, to provide benefit to society. So our idea was, why can't psychology do the same? Right? So psychology, as usual, as, as somebody who's trying to understand people and what they do in the real world, often looks like this, which is a really, really awkward situation that is sort of hard for everybody involved. It's expensive for us as psychologists to run these studies. It's annoying for you to have to get up to the door and answer our questions. Wouldn't it be nice if we also could listen in to the traffic in data centers to do some of what we're interested in? Fortunately, somebody invented the social internet. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram now span the globe. If you compare sort of your basic pool of people you can reach, you go from something like this, a thousand people is a really nice study, to something like that. And the basic premise that this is a good idea is that the numbers on the right are larger than the numbers on the left. <laughs> the other thing that's different about the internet is that you do away with the awkward situation, at least in most regards. Um, in a way, sites like Facebook have become our digital campfires. It's where people share about the self, emotional updates, updates about the self, what's going on in their lives, um, without that sort of artificiality. If I ask you what your life satisfaction is, you can't give me an answer right away. You have to go through a process of introspection that ends up scanning the society around you, your relative standing. You do a lot of things to give me an answer to a question. If I can just listen in to what you would be telling your friends anyway, I might be in a better spot to come up with more nuanced findings about you. Um, so here's the sketch of a method. I tried to really nail this down to its basics, but I want you to have a sense of how this basic technology works. There's people. People have Facebook. Um, at this point, we have to ask them for permission. Every single one in our studies, we have to get their permission to access their data. Facebook doesn't give us any data. 
at the same time, we also know other things about people. We know uh, we can give them a survey, right? We can give them a personality survey, the same thing I just said we would never do, we, we, we can do here. Um, we also may know their age and their gender because we can know that from the Facebook platform. Those things already come as numbers, so we can turn them into numbers. That's not hard, that's good. Um, and now, from Facebook, we pull their language, their, their status updates. Um, the nice thing about Facebook is, if you do this kind of research, the moment you ask people to give you permission to access their statuses, you pull four years' worth of statuses. That comes out to something like 20 to 30,000 words. That is a book you have written over four years with small updates about the self. And we turn this into numbers. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do this in a moment. But basically, we turn the status updates into a set of numbers about people, sort of the content of their language. We have these other things. We do some correlation, and then we visualize the results. That's the sort of basic idea of our method. Um, and the one thing we'll do here in terms of turning words into numbers is just to count words. What's the relative frequency with which people use words? Happy, say, is 3% of your language. So the score for you, your, the happy word score for you is 3%. And now what we can do is look at what language goes together with certain variables. Okay, this all sounds a little complicated. It should become clear in a moment. Simple example, here's the language that distinguishes females on Facebook. Right. And in the coding of these results that we've chosen over the years, the larger the word, the more predictive it is of, is of being female. The color indexes the frequency. So something that's gray is rarely used. Something that's blue is moderately used. Something that's red, that's, it's frequently used. So something like the less than three there, the hard character, is both highly predictive because it's big and it's used frequently because it's red. If you look at something like yummy or hubby, still highly predictive of being female, much less frequently used. Here's men. <laughs> So, so this looks like a, a, a terrible stereotype generator. Um, keep in mind that what we're quizzing here are sort of societal roles and so forth. So um, the, the curse words that you see um, is a form of disagreeableness. So we've sort of isolated that down. Men are more likely to be disagreeable, say things that go against the social contract, the social norm. This is why it's a good marker of being male. Um, you see a lot of competition. Right, so you see a lot of video games. COD is not fishing, it's Call of Duty. It's a video game, competitive military video game. The other thing you see in here is not wife and girlfriend, but my wife and my girlfriend. Um, because our algorithms found that that phrase is more predictive of being male than just girlfriend or wife. So as a, as a female, you talk about other people's relational terms. If you're a man, you sort of only talk about your own. But we can do a little more subtle, be a little more subtle than this. So this is extroversion. It's exactly what you think it means. It's a sort of gold standard, well-established construct in psychology. It's the amount of reward that you get from social interactions, in a sense. That's the language of extroversion. Single most predictive feature here, party. Now, many of you, or you in the past, in the generalized sense, have told me that you could have told me that. Um, there's a lot of things that seem obvious after the fact, right? This is our hindsight bias. Um, the other thing you see in here and can't wait is the lack of an apostrophe. It's the sort of problems with impulse regulation that lead you to not have time for an apostrophe. So you can't wait. Um, here's the language of introversion. So this is, this is very Generation Y. If you're confused why there's so many alphanumeric characters, these, uh, these are Japanese emoticons that are eye-focused as opposed to mouth-focused. You see a lot of sort of internet culture, Japanese culture. When we showed this at the University of Pennsylvania to the computer science department, they asked us if you could make a t-shirt out of this. <laughs> so that's uh, this is fairly subtle, right? So now we're sort of, we're doing this kind of analysis on something that's a real psychological construct, not just obvious demographics. Um, but can we play this game in reverse? Once we've learned the language that goes with these constructs, can we then flip it around and say, I, if I only have your language, do I know what your personality profile is? So 
So what we've done is we've asked, or colleagues of ours at Cambridge University, asked friends to fill out a personality inventory about you, and at the same time we had your Facebook language. So we have a baseline of how well a friend knows you, and then we can compare it against how well our computer knows you. Um, here, this is sort of the standard model of a lot of personality psychology. It's called the Big Five model of, um, of personality, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. Neuroticism, tendency for sort of negative emotionality, irritability. That's the friend accuracy. That's how well our language does. Agreeableness, that's how well language does. Extroversion, right? You just saw it. Conscientiousness, and then openness to experience, intellect we outperform the friends. So most of them are too close to Carl with the exception of openness, which is a sort of, it's a, it's a finding that holds through different types of research that openness is something that these algorithms are really good at picking up on. Um, incidentally, uh, single most predictive feature for um, being high in openness is the word physics, um, which I always thought was curious. Um, so the bottom line of this is that we're about as good, our algorithms are about as good at predicting your personality as a friend is of predicting your personality. Your mom's probably better than our algorithm. But can we do, at this point people think, okay, but aren't you putting on a face on social media? Isn't that something, isn't there a social desirability bias? Don't you want people to see you in a certain way? The answer to that question is yes, there is. Um, we looked at different sets of text in the US in particular. Um, you're less likely to mention negative emotion when things aren't going so well and you're less likely to mention failure in your life um, if, if things really don't go well. So if you think about a little bit about American society, sort of the Protestant work ethic, the sort of myth of being successful and being positive, they, they sort of, they, they reappear as social desirability biases. But what, what for us fortunately is true about this is that that works on all of us about to the same extent. So the fact that person A is different from person B in some extent is still interpretable to our algorithms. I know this is a very sort of nitpicky answer, but the, the, the big picture is we can handle most of these biases. The other thing is the sampling bias, but at this point, platforms like Facebook penetrate half the population. Show me a psychology study that captures 10% of the population, right? And if you ha have half the population and you know the agent demographics, very easy game to re-stratify the sample. You have a representative sample. So, Let's get to something as nuanced as depression. And I want to play a little game with you. It's the uh, hindsight bias avoidance game. Um, <laughs> the low mood facet of depression. So depression is often sort of conceptualized as low interest and low mood. Um, what do you think, just take a moment in your mind, pick the word that you think best exemplifies low mood. What's going on in the life of somebody who has really low mood? I can't actually take ideas, but I'll, 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 I'll listen to you afterwards what you think. It's the word alone, followed by lonely. And people who are depressed say depression, they say it rarely. When they say it, it's highly predictive, right? Because it's big of depression. But would you have guessed that it would have been alone as opposed to something else? How about low self-worth? Take a moment. The answer is why. And it's not just why, it's also forms of sort of epistemic hedging of not quite relating to the world. Look at, look at apparently, actually, probably. These are all word, words that sort of disengage you from making claims about the real world, take you a step back, disengage you, disconnect you, don't commit you, right? Sort of into a stance of questioning. So this is very curious, and this is, this is sort of the beginning of a data-driven psychology, right? So we have all these awesome theories of what depression is, but by just using a very simple basic measure as to whether people are depressed, and then figuring out what's going on in their lives that sounds like depression, we begin to have a process understanding of what could be some of these things that drive depression, right? Um, so this person, right, you enroll them in a, in a meaningful writing course, this person, you do a social intervention, right? At least that's sort of some of the avenues that's suggested here. All of these findings are cross-sectional, not hinting at causation, it's just an idea for further research. So I hope at this point I've convinced you that through this language analysis, you can show the emotions and behaviors of people, 
and that you have a method to unobtrusively measure these states in people across entire populations, and that that works reasonably well, even with really nuanced psychological constructs, and that biases can be handled, that we can measure these things, that we can statistically control for them. But we can also do this at a different level, because now we're at web scale. We're no longer married to um, your individual level analysis. You can also do this for communities. So we have US counties, and from US counties, we started with about, with about a billion tweets. We figured out for 150 million of these tweets, we could figure out what county in the US they were sent from, covering about 88% of the counties. We collect all that Twitter data from a county. So counties are people too. We sort of pretend that a county is a person with all that language. And at the same time, about counties, we can learn things from agencies such as the Centers for Disease Control, the Borough of Labor Statistics, and so forth. So now we can play the same game again. We can say, okay, I, I have heart disease of these counties, I have income, education, those are all numbers that's good. And we have tweets. I'm gonna turn the tweets into some sort of number. I'm gonna summarize the language somehow, and then I'm gonna, um, gonna correlate it. The way we're doing this right now is through topic extraction in this example. You can use any method in any example, but it sort of works the best here. Topic extraction is relying on clusters of coherent language that a cluster and detection algorithm has pulled out for you in advance. Um, it's a really nice way of taking language, which is a terrible set of uh, variables, right? Just the frequency of words is a terrible set of, uh, it's a terrible space to do statistics in. But by doing this sort of multidimensional reduction and clustering it down to little clusters of language, you can say, oh, this person is a distribution over these topics. Okay, I'm losing you. I'll make it really quick. Um, right, so we do this topic extraction. We have numbers. We correlate each topic again to get a sense of how much these different topics are associated with these other things we know about the counties. And then we visualize. So here's the language that's most predictive of heart disease across the US. Right? So that's what the data shows us. And now we as psychologists look at this and give it a name. Right? So in this case, I'm going to call this hate or interpersonal tension, something that has to do with strained social relationships. You see this again. So irritability, sympathetic arousal, so when your stress hormone system in your body is activated, that looks like hostility and aggression. But then we also see this. That looks like boredom, that looks like disengagement, that looks like not having a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Now imagine you lived in a community where that was the psychological reality of the people around you. Remember the hostility in your neighbors, imagine the hostility on the road, right? How there is hate in your neighborhood, how you don't have a reason to get out of bed. You can see how it begins to have the risk profile that leads to heart disease. We've also flipped this around and say, okay, show me what protects from heart disease. What are the behaviors that people engage in that, makes them, that might make them healthier? Well, it looks like this, having positive experiences. There's a rich literature that suggests that positive emotions undo negative emotions and can sort of buffer against adversity. It's called the social buffering hypothesis. So, okay. But then you also have this. So every epidemiologist will now say sanity check, check, because that looks like education and income which we know are highly protective from heart disease. But then you also see stuff like this. And make up a name for it in your head. The one that I made up is optimism. Could be resilience, could be goal pursuit. But something to do with an attitude of overcoming, planning, setting goals, pursuing them. So how well do we do? We can play this game again. We only use the language. We're trying to predict heart disease data. Um, on the left is Centers for Disease Control, on the right is just Twitter information. And it's beginning to look like Google flu trends, now with heart disease. And when we compare this against other predictors, how well do we do against sort of what epidemiologists do anyway? These are demographics, they do somewhat well. So the, the longer the bar, the better the prediction. Here are the behavioral risk factors and precursor, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, obesity. Here's income and education, still very, very predictive. Here is the gold standard epidemiological model that throws all of this into a model and says, okay, use all of this information to predict heart disease. And here's just Twitter by itself. And it's significant. So where are we taking this? 
Well, you can do a life risk map for heart disease. Think about evidence-based policy. Think about trying to do something in your community and having very fine-grained needles that you can see move in response to building a new swimming pool or trying a new intervention. And we can take this to patients. You had a cardiac episode, you're at, or you've just given birth and you're at risk for post, postpartum depression. If we have something on your phone that can monitor your risk and give your clinician a heads up, right? The goal is not to replace your clinician. The goal is to provide decision support, decision support, red flags, early warnings. So thank you very much. This is obviously a team effort. This is the rest of the team. Thank you so much. Okay, it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, I think you'll see these three talks fit together remarkably well. We tried to actually have a coordination call, but we never managed to coordinate. And uh, you'll see many of the themes uh, appear in, in my presentation that we've already heard uh, earlier. So I want to talk about digital behavior. And as I understand the charge, we're going to look at how digital behavior was different than uh, real world behavior. So I'm going to talk about privacy enhancing searches, a little bit along the lines of what Shlomo was talking about with anonymous screen, activity bias, impact of weather, temporal and geographic correlation of searches, kind of along the lines of what Johannes was talking about. And then I want to talk a little bit about the value of search and the kinds of questions people ask and so on. So that's my topic for my 14 minutes. So I claim search engines are the best thing that ever happened for privacy. And if you read the newspapers, it's almost exactly the opposite of what all the newspapers say. The reason is people ask all sorts of very sensitive questions to search engines. How do I know if I'm pregnant? How do I know if I'm gay? What are the symptoms of herpes? What fractions of tax returns are audited? All sorts of questions. Questions, I have to say, they would never ask to their friends, their minister, their parents, their doctors, their lawyers, their librarians, accountants. Never ask because it would worry about leakage, gossip. You know, Mark Twain said, Two can keep a secret if one of them's dead. <laughs> well, Google isn't exactly dead, but it's not exactly alive either, so uh, it's kind of in between in that sense. And, and search engines give you pretty authoritative and good answers to those questions. So there's a huge social value there that people now have a way to get answers to sensitive questions without having to pose them to any individual. And I was going to suggest a little A-B test that, uh, that you might run since you're all uh, behavioral people. You could ask all of your friends, well, what exactly are the symptoms of herpes? And then see who sits next to you at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, much, it's really nice. It's really useful to have this uh, forum to ask these anonymous questions. At this point, as it, it, Ben Witties, I think, first made this point in a paper called Keeping Better Score, the privacy benefits from privacy threats. So the glass is both half full and half empty at the same time. It's a very interesting point that, uh, that Ben came up with. Second point, I want to talk about bursty behavior. And this is something everybody in this audience should be sensitive to. Uh, some colleagues of mine uh, uh, at Yahoo showed promotional videos to Mechanical Turk users promotional videos that promoted Yahoo, and they were so excited because they found out that the, the more people saw the promotional videos, the more people went to Yahoo. So it was like the perfect confirmation that this kind of advertising really worked. But then they checked a little further, and they showed videos that had nothing to do with Yahoo. And in fact, uh, they were also much more likely to visit Yahoo, okay? So you had, have to do your A-B tests uh, right in the right way. And the reason is they happen to be more active on the internet. And so they were more likely to see the promotional video, whatever it was about, and more likely to go to Yahoo on days that they were more active, four times a day. So if you look at it from the viewpoint of, uh, of a little chart here, people were only active in those, uh, I don't know what color that is, brown box. And then they were doing all sorts of different things in the brown box. They weren't active at all these other times. And so indeed, it looks like there's correlation between whatever they're doing during the activity, the, during the active period. So anytime you do this, make sure that you look both at placebo tests and the real phenomena you're trying to look for the uh, correlation. Whenever you have bursty activity like this, you're going to be subject to the same sort of problem and it's a, it's a danger that looks there for any kind of online analysis. Now, it's a little bit different with mobile devices. And here I've drawn, let's see if I get it right, in blue I've shown what PC desktop use looks like. These are queries to Google by time of day. 
In green, I've shown you what mobile phone activity looks like. And in red, I've shown you what tablet looks like. And what happens with the desktop, of course, it's most active during business hours, when you're at work, dealing with your computer. Your phone is pretty much flat all through the time of day. People do sleep a little bit there in the morning, it looks like. But most of the time, they're using phone at pretty much a level uh, amount. And tablets are the most interesting, in a way, because that's really content access. You might be looking at the newspaper or book in the morning, and then you're looking at the evening, not so much during the middle of the day. So the kind of activity I showed you earlier, there's a certain form of activity bias, which you might call the classic activity bias. But now you want to look at activity bias on different media, because those different media are going to have different time patterns uh, during the day. Weather. See, weather is this amazingly important phenomenon. We didn't realize this till rather late. We were looking at um, online advertising, online sales, and we saw these patterns, and we couldn't figure out what the patterns were about, and then we discovered, gosh, they were really about weather. And so I'll prove that to you. Look at the red line, the red bar chart up there. That's showing the temperature deviation from the normal temperature at that time of year, okay? So you can see it's warmer at the beginning, and it's a little mixed, and then at the end it's colder. And now if you look down on the bottom chart, what that's showing you is the uh, uh, queries for apparel on a Google uh, shopping. And you can see when it's warm here and nice at the beginning, there are fewer queries. The, other, the, the queries uh, on apparel go below the line. And when it gets cold, they go above. And the general principle there is when you have bad weather, people stay inside and shop online, and we have good weather, they go out to the mall and have fun and shop offline. So what you see is when the, uh, from Google's viewpoint, it's really good to market in a place where there's bad weather. And you won't be surprised that the UK, of course, is our second biggest market. <laughs> I will tell you that uh, this applies on the east coast of the US, it applies in Belgium, Netherlands, all these different places, and the North Atlantic. It doesn't apply so much in California. So that's why it took us so long to recognize that weather was actually important. All right, weather's important for shopping. It also creates demand for specific categories, such as swimwear, and that kind of interacts in an interesting way over here on the chart, on the left side, I'm showing what happens when people are accessing uh, Google through computers and tablets. And on the right side, I'm showing you what happens when they're accessing Google through a mobile device. And the uh, query is, let's see, on, uh, oh yeah, red is non-work day and black is work day for the lines. And we're looking at the, uh, the uh, queries, differences on swimwear. And what's interesting there is when it gets warmer, people are going to have more queries on swimwear, not surprisingly. But then during the weekends, they actually have less queries on swimwear. Why is that? Because actually uh, they're going out and having a good time. They're not staying indoors. And so you look at the right, but on mobile, they've got their phone with them. So they're outside, they see it's warm, and they're still doing queries on swimwear even when it's warm because they're carrying this portable uh, device with them. So there's a lot of subtleties in terms of understanding these patterns. One part is, it, is that you're going to see more mobile searches when it's warm, because people are going outside carrying it with them, but you're going to see less desktop searches because they aren't staying inside because of this lousy weather, but then the kinds of things they search for are going to be similar on both uh, devices, and what happens uh, to the devices is going to depend on the interaction of those two uh, effects. Now, I'm going to talk tomorrow a bit about this search correlation across time and space, and this lines up very well with what we just heard from uh, Johannes. I want to give you a few kind of illustrative examples that, uh, that might there'd be a preview of coming attractions. Here's a nice example. This is Google Correlate, which came out of the Flu Trends project. And what we're looking at there is the queries on weight loss. Okay, weight loss. And if you look at that, it turns out one of the very highly correlated queries with weight loss is best vacation spots. So when people are searching for places to go on vacation, it seems that they also might think they'll lose a few pounds before they, uh, before they go there. This is a picture of what that correlation looks like, queries on weight loss and vacation spots. 
Well, not too surprisingly, the biggest day of the year on queries for weight loss is New Year's Day. We all know what that means. And about that time is when people are also querying very heavily on uh, places to go on vacation. But you can see the two series are, in fact, very, very highly correlated. And in fact, if you look at what's correlated with weight loss three weeks later, uh, it's not losing weight, alas. <laughs> or weight loss plateau, or way, sort of that sad story that Google is telling you not only when they look for weight loss, but how long it takes for them to realize that, gee, it's not as easy as I had hoped. Now, here's a nice one. This is kind of interesting. This is looking at US data on the query seasonal affective disorder, sometimes abbreviated SAD. It happens in the winter when it's all gray and cloudy and so on. And, and you see there's this very strong seasonal pattern. That's the time series. But look at the geographic pattern. If you actually draw a line across the US, pretty much everything north of that line, you see these heavy uh, queries on seasonal affective disorder. And there's Alaska down at the bottom, which has uh, quite uh, high queries in this topic. But then once you're below that line, it's very rarely seen. And I suppose you'd like to see what the UK looks like. So here in, uh, in, it turns out Wales and Northern Ireland, not so bad. England kind of in the middle and those poor people up in Scotland uh, look, uh, look pretty uh, depressed, at least uh, for a good part of the year. And uh, that's what the seasonal pattern looks like down, down below. Now, I'm going to do almost a replay of what you heard from Johannes, but instead of you using tweets, I'm going to use queries. And uh, we thought about doing this because we looked at a paper by Ed Glazier and, and colleagues uh, about unhappy cities, happy and unhappy cities. So the CDC does this surveillance uh, survey, and they ask a question, in general, how satisfied are you with your life? How satisfied are you with your life? They get answers for 174 SMSAs or DMAs, and uh, the map looks like that. But we asked the question, what queries, what kind of searches are the most uh, highly correlated or most highly predictive of uh, the answers to uh, this question? You know, how satisfied? Very satisfied? Well, we interpret that as being very happy. Not so satisfied, we interpret that as being unhappy. And we ask what kind of queries are predictive of that answer. And in this case, we aren't going to use individual queries. We're going to use categories of queries. And there's what it looks like. Black means it's a negative predictor of happiness. White means it's a positive predictor of happiness. And the number one negative predictor were gambling-related queries. When you dig in a little deeper, that's not Las Vegas and glamor. That's lotto, where people are looking at just lotto-type queries. Manufacturing is kind of the Rust Belt story. Insurance, that's a positive predictor, because insurance is what we, in economics, would call a normal good or a superior good, even. If you're pretty well off, then you can afford to buy insurance. If you're not well off, then you can't. Coupons and discount offers, you're looking for bargains, say, trying to save money, and so on and so on. And here's the picture of the correlation between the happiness predicted using those categories I just described and the actual happiness as measured by the CDC. And what's the first question that comes into your mind when you see that chart? Saying, well, well where are those happy and unhappy cities, right? Turns out the happiest city is Charlottesville, Virginia, and the unhappiest city is New York, New York. So that's the uh, picture that emerges from the uh, query categories that we, uh, we just looked at. What questions do people ask about celebrities? So you know the ce celebrity du jour today is Donald Trump, and this is just a selection of the most popular queries about Donald Trump, ranked pretty much in order. One of the things you find when you look at this is for almost every celebrity, the top queries are how old are they and how tall are they? So uh, this is uh, Donald Trump saying. Now the question you might ask is, well, people are asking all these queries about celebrities. Isn't that kind of a waste of time? They might as well be on Facebook or tweets or something like that. And so we had a little study of what's the value of, of, uh, of a search engine? What's the value of Google? And I'll take one minute to describe this. Uh, what we did is we looked at a group of uh, students, this is uh, Yan Chan at the University of Michigan, asked them to answer uh, 1,420 queries, one using Google 
and two, using the library. Okay? So we started in the lobby of the library. You have to go to the library. And uh, what happens is it took on average 22 minutes to answer a question using the library, seven minutes using Google. That was 15 minutes a day uh, savings per question. So you have to ask yourself, well, how much does that translate to into dollars? But the first thing you have to realize is, well, when answers were expensive, we ask few questions. And now answers are cheap, and we ask a lot of questions. We ask how tall Donald Trump is, or how did he make his money, all these sort of crazy things that you'd never bother to ask uh, 15 or 20 years ago. So it's a little consumer surplus calculation. We're going to say, well, when getting answers was expensive, we asked very few questions. Now getting answers is cheap, we ask a lot of questions. You try to take the area in the graph, and it turns out after from rather heroic assumptions, we end up with uh, the search uh, engine being worth about a dollar a day. About a dollar a day, actually a dollar 37 a day. So it's pretty, pretty valuable service. Uh, uh, by comparison, subscription to New York Times costs about $600 uh, a year. This is uh, $500 a year in total value, and it's all available for free. So I'll end on that point. Thanks. Thank you for that fascinating talk. So I'd like to invite our speakers back on the stage. Um, now, we have a roving mic, the lady in the fabulous blue shirt at the back. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes for questions, which is actually yeah, not bad. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, does anyone want to kick us off with a burning question that they might have? Yes, lady in the pink at the front, please. Um, it's, I guess it's a question about the value of information. So if, hi, hello. <laughs> um, so, oh, hi, sorry, I'm, I'm Papa Mulvaney. Um, I'm doing a PhD in uh, University of Bristol. Um, and I study social interactions. And what I'm interested in is the value of information. So your graph before was basically saying that you know, answers are cheap, and so now we're able to answer, uh, we ask all the questions we want to. And there's no longer pub debates, we just bring out our phone. But my problem is, is that suddenly your information is also valueless in a way. Like if I can just look up how tall Donald Trump is, and I can gain probably a million different answers because everyone's gonna have a different opinion on it, then do you think, that actually is a bad thing, that we're now devaluing the information because everyone can now get their hands on it. I know free information is great, but there's no way to kind of understand what's actually good about it. Yeah, yeah so, so that's kind of the, the, the issue that I wanted to get at, that really the marginal question or the question where it really doesn't care very much whether you know the answer, it's not really v worth very much to the individual. How much would you pay to know how tall Donald Trump is? I mean, not very much, but you could issue that question because it's just so easy and cheap to do it. But the point is the search engine also provides you the answers with this really important question. You might need to know to make some important decision or in writing your paper or something would be hard to find otherwise. So you have to do that kind of consumer surplus calculation to calculate the fact that now it's much easier to get answers to important questions as well as to get answers to trivial questions. So you know, uh, this is a back of the envelope calculation but it gives you a rough idea of what that uh, average might look like. I think there's another interesting thing there, which was I read last year that one of the biggest questions that was asked was what is the meaning of love? Yeah. And I think when we're asking the really important questions, or who am I, for instance, we're so used to getting immediate answers that it seems to me that many of us, and I suffer from this too, are very reluctant to do the work to discover the meaning within ourselves, the hard work that, that comes from introspection, from debate with friends. Um, and so I wonder if we're missing a huge amount of value through that kind of almost Socratic questioning um, that we might otherwise get just because it's so easy to do that kind of search. Um, should we take another question? We've got the gentleman over there and then a couple down at the front. Let's go at the back first, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, are people more honest online than they are uh, you know, face to face? I mean, and this is uh, especially in the financial services. For example, if you're applying for a loan, are you more likely to lie on your online application or uh, to a bank clerk or the bank manager? We, we definitely need, Emotional. yeah, thank you. We, we definitely need more research, but there are reasons to believe that people are more honest online. For example, men and women have the same amount of sex if you ask it online. If you ask it <laughs> offline, we know that there's this bias that men have sex all day and women don't. Um, so, there are all sorts of, of evidence that the answers seem uh, more honest, but I do think we need 
a lot more research, and I agree with you, it has huge implications for financial services, whether you sell enhanced annuities, all sorts of other insurance uh, products, fraud, and all those type of issues. You might actually need to start pricing differently, depending on the medium via which you get the answers to write the policy. Okay, let's take uh, another question down here, and there was a second person as well for afterwards. So just in the third row back, thank you. Thanks, yeah, we saw the map of where the digital activity is most prevalent, and there's a lot of gaps. So I'm wondering, do you see any big blind spots in what we analyze between countries or maybe between social groups? And is there any things that you're doing about it to gain insights any? Well, I'll say one point on that. Uh, there are, when you look at economic variables, so things like automobile sales, and that's well predicted by queries. I'm thinking about buying an automobile or looking at reviews, things like this. Vacation planning, that's well predicted by queries and so on. And this is true even in countries where you have much lower internet penetration because, of course, it's the people with a disposable income who actually have the internet connections. So when you're looking at economic data, you get surprisingly good answers even where internet penetration is 30%, 40%. Now that probably does not extend to other areas, but for that application at least, the internet penetration is not so important. Great, this is very succinct, this is brilliant. Okay, let's take the second question. There's another one on the third row. You lost your question. Was it you? Okay, yes, thanks. Uh, I wonder if all of the panel might speculate. A lot of the effects that you uh, pointed out feel like they might be culturally or temporally specific, so that people feeling that anime, for example, predicts depression, or sorry, to introversion might not be true in 10 years' time, or that some techniques which prompt particular behaviors now might become overused, or people become used to them. And I wonder if you might speculate on which of these things you feel are permanent effects of the digital space and which ones might change. Such a good question, isn't it? Well, <laughs> there's, there's a lot there. I think there are a lot of differences, even just our, our visual preferences. I mean, these are visual devices. Uh, turns out that uh, men in Thailand, I think, like pink. Uh, and there are differences in, in how complex of a website we like. So I think there are a lot of, of differences. And then I think the other part about whether people will get uh, used to the devices, maybe they will not be as anonymous or more maybe with time. Um, I think we have very little research to be honest. Uh, when I wrote the book, I had to work hard to get a little bit from computer science, a little bit here, a little bit here and put it together. I do know that, that younger and more energetic people who are going through PhD student, uh, programs now are actually focused on it, so I think we'll have a lot more of the answers. I think there's an interesting thing there as well with the way in which people are choosing to use the web. So when you look sort of 10, 15 years ago, and Google was a search engine, and it's now a good search engine, but it's also a marketing platform, an advertising platform. And you look at the ways in which people are reclaiming and in reclaiming an internet because they're in that period where they believed it was standing for something else. So encrypted services like PQ Chat, or you have um, Ethereum, which is like a blockchain alternative, almost an alternative internet. You're getting a fragmented web. And I think what's really interesting is that you, there is some speculation to suggest that um, we're going to end up into a, sort of into a space where people occupy walled gardens. And some of those will be more over here, and it's encrypted, and it's private, and they're basing stuff out of um, countries such as Germany and the Nordic countries that have better privacy controls, and then you'll have some people who can't afford to buy paid for services, like I'll pay $2 a day if I don't get advertised to, and then you'll get people in this space over here doing something completely different, you'll get people who are going completely offline, and you're starting to see this fragmented approach, especially in younger people in terms of the way that they won't just go to a full utility platform like Facebook where you can do everything all at once. They're not on there. There's a cultural element. My parents are on there. It's not cool. But also, I don't want to be associated with this, this business because there's so many things that they're doing that I don't agree with. There's a principal cultural shift in a new generation coming up. So I think we're looking at quite a splintered web in the next 10 years or so from what I've experienced with the way that people are starting to use it now. Would Cer anyone like to? Yeah, so, so certainly the major migrations between platforms on the web are now much faster than generations. So um, I talked to a bunch of high schoolers not too long ago. And Facebook is out in high schools. You don't use Facebook. Your mom's on Facebook. Right? That, the, the social life of high schools now happens on Twitter. Uh, and this is probably on its way out. If you look at Weibo in China, it has gone, with, within four or five years, it has gone from 
no users to hundreds of millions of users. So the, it's a, but it's a herd migration, part of, partly because it's a social web, but it's become really, really fast. And every platform has different design principles, has different sort of emotional engineering to make people interact with this. Weibo does this really, really well. Um, one thing I heard from uh, a Chinese friend is so makes Weibo is so nice um, is that um, it's kind of hard to type the Chinese alphabet on a tiny screen, but it has a has a microphone button, right? Everything has a microphone button, microphone button now. But it allows your aunt to communicate with you because she can just record a little hello for you, and it's easy and tech friendly and it's well controlled. So um, with these different platforms, the use profile changes, the use people make of it changes. Um, what is attracted in people changes, so it's a, it's a super fluid environment. Uh, I hope it'll continue to use text, at least in some extent, because then otherwise we're hopeless. Right, we've got um, another, quite a few questions. So one at the front, the lady over there, because we haven't had a lady in a while, and then quite a few more. We've got some time, don't worry. Hey, let's quickly take a question for Johannes. We did some similar mapping of, uh, I'm from the Free Standards Agency, we did some similar mapping of norovirus against um, Twitter language and found that there was a, a, a valid correlation and we can actually predict outbreaks of norovirus a few days if not a week before hospital reports start coming in which is kind of useful. Um, did you find, we, we used Twitter for that, did you find any different, I can't remember which platforms you said you used, um, we find Twitter more useful than that. Sorry, what virus was this? Norovirus. Norovirus. Um, yeah, sort of Twitter is the go-to source for disease tracking right now, certainly. Um, the, as you know, there were controversies um, because that doesn't work so well because uh, in, in some instances, because the media reporting about, say, an H5N9 outbreak begins to swamp the signal from the actual disease. So you have these two pieces of signal in, in the mix that you have to disaggregate. But Twitter remains the go-to platform for digital epidemiology or infodemiology or whatever, yeah. Okay, so um, lady just behind us, five rows back, and then we'll come to the gentleman in the front. Hi there, I'm Nikki from the Union in Edinburgh. Also a question for um, Johannes. I was interested in your um, looking at the language analysis on Facebook, and I wondered if it had been ever um, used to analyze the characteristics of people that had um, succeeded in long-term behavior change, such as weight loss and what the characteristics are that um, could help others for whether healthier eating, greener behaviors, and so on. I mean, that's the answer is not yet. We're working on some, some of those things that are similar, some of those with BIT here, with the Behavioral Insight Team. Um, what, what makes good learners good learners? Uh, what makes an intervention an effective intervention? So the next round of research, uh, research in this space combines intervention with some of these data-driven insight methodologies. But you're right on. That's what I wonder about as well. Yeah. Okay, let's take one from the front, and then we'll move to this side, because I know some burning questions. So can we have the microphone on the front row, please? Thank you. Kirill Dushkin, McKinsey. Um, question for the first two speakers mostly. Um, when we think about kind of startups and good e-commerce companies, they're doing a lot of things right in terms of they're experimenting, doing A-B testing, they know marketing very well. And my question is, what specifically can behavioral insights or web psychology bring on top which the startups or the e-commerce companies cannot do by themselves without these insights? I would say first and foremost, it provides a context within which to design tests um, and to understand the connections between behaviors. And I think if we look at, it's one of the questions that was raised in an earlier session, if you look at um, the motivations and pr principles that underlie certain offline behaviors in the physical world, typically those principles and motivations translate to other environments. It's just the expression of those motivations might be different. So if you can have a good grounding in behavioral economics and psychology, um, and then be able to, to have more of an understanding as to how and why things are happening, in a particular way, you can design much more uh, rich and informed hypotheses to then test and maybe split test and the rest of it. It gives you a higher baseline is how I would respond to that. What, what would you say? <clears throat> I would actually take a very different approach. We got the Googles of the world that do whatever, 10,000 tests a year, and obviously we don't know how much they actually know, which is probably a lot. When you go, in my opinion, when you go below the top five companies, 
there's very little um, A-B testing in, in some companies. I can tell you that among the largest three pension providers in the US, there's probably two that have never done a single A-B test. You're talking about organizations that cater to millions of people. When you go to those who you think are experts, like OTAs, online travel agencies, you would think those guys really know the A-B testing game. Anyone tried to book a hotel on Expedia website versus Expedia Mobile and compare the prices? Expedia Mobile is sometimes 30% cheaper. Now, I've asked, I don't remember which one of the OTAs I asked about it, so it might have not been Expedia, but I said, why? And the answer was, because the hotels give us discount for mobile. I say, okay, did you ever test that it shouldn't be the other way around? Actually, I have a lot of reasons to believe it should be the other way around, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, they said no. So I say, then what are you actually testing with your A-B testing? If there are 30% discounts, it might be that you need a 30% premium. You've left a lot of money. So we changed the buy button. We made it bigger and more red, and, and I said, okay, got that. Um, so I think there's a lot of superficial A-B testing going, whether it's startups or more established companies. I think bringing in the psychology would make them rethink what to test. And I don't think it's one or the other. I, I do think they need to change the size of the book button and, and the color. They should do that. But there's much more to do, like whether you think about an annuity supermarket, do you place the different products, the financial services and annuities and products in the columns and the features of the products horizontally, or do you flip it? I'm yet to find actually a company that's been trying it in a thoughtful way. I'm sure they are, uh, but most of those I chatted with don't think about it. So in a nutshell, I think you should expand the type of you know, tests that you do and bring in the science, not just the intuition, and they can coexist. Cool. Let's take some questions from this side of the room. And I want to do a quick time check. How much time do we have left? How many questions can we take? Okay, great. So we'll take a handful. So first, uh, second row at the front, may we have a mic? Oh, you've got a mic. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Joseph Duss. I'm a journalist with the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Um, I've got some relatives who are sort of under 10, small children who are far better with their iPads or whatever than I am. And they use some, um, not just for games, but they use Google quite a lot. They search for bizarre things. And I was wondering if there's been any kind of big studies about what children that are too young for Facebook and Twitter, what they search for. Um, if there's, or is that not an ethical thing to do? Or do we know anything about this? It's, it's a sensitive area. Uh, in fact, uh, if you're, if you're in the US, if you're under 18, you're supposed to have uh, parental supervision. Um, so you, when, you, when you sign up for Google, you are actually state your age, and it's amazing how many 18-year-olds there are compared to the demographics. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, so the trouble is that research is somewhat inhibited in this area. So it's probably also true to say that research happens in the societal back mirror. Research is always on societal trends, so sort of 10, 20, 25, 30 years behind. We, don't, we know very, very little about the generation, the digital generations that are growing up online, the three-year-olds that know how to Zoom but not how to flip a book, right? Um, it's, it'll be fascinating. I mean, there, and entire fields are scratching their heads wondering what the hell will happen. Cognitive development, emotional development, social development, it's all uncharted. We don't know. I mean, I don't know. Let me flip back to the last question, because I do want to uh, raise one issue about A-B testing. Trouble with A-B testing, as we do in science, is it's quite costly, usually, because you're dealing with a fixed sample size. Hmm. And we've been shifting much more towards sequential testing or multi-arm bandits. Uh, in fact, if you use the um, publisher experiments on Google, it's actually a multi-arm bandit where you're doing a sequential test and decide whether you've accumulated enough evidence to decide in favor of, uh, of one of the uh, arms. And I think you're going to see that uh, in this subject as well because testing is really pretty expensive in terms of opportunity costs and there are more efficient ways to do it if, you, if you're willing to, uh, to build the systems to do it. Uh, more generally, if you're interested about the impact of tech on children, there's one 
really um, comprehensively written white paper called Children Wired for Better or Worse, I think it's called. Um, and that cites a whole bunch of research that's been done um, on things like emotional cues and other such stuff that might be an interesting starting point for you. Um, it doesn't relate specifically to search, but it's in that general area. Okay, let's take another couple of questions. Uh, so two at the back on this side, the lady with um, the red hair and the guy at the chat with the glasses. Hi, I'm Elizabeth from JustGiving.com. Um, so on our site, we have people, and it's mainly a question for Johannes, we have people creating a lot of user-created content, telling people why they're doing these events for charity and um, people leaving messages of support. Now, we can do some analysis and sort of find out what's interesting in the trends, but I'm curious as to how we get actual sort of business insights out of the sort of textual analysis that will help us drive different business decisions. Uh, you mean short of hiring a data scientist who knows how to do this? Or? We have some, we have some. So we do, you know, we, we've just got to figure out, you know, how do we focus on, you know, what, what can actually drive the numbers? Um, I'm, I'm, I have some pro tips okay. if you want to hear them. Um, use stuff like latent Dirichlet allocation, so good clustering algorithms um, that are well supported in the literature. LSA is less interpretable, latent semantic analysis. Uh, once you represent the, the language as topics, use very, fairly simple statistics that you can interpret, multiple linear regression models or the machine learning equivalents because the results are interpretable. Uh, correlation is your friend. Um, date the data. Do a scatter plot. I mean, it's, 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 it's I don't know. It, it takes time and sort of a data scientist who does this sort of for a living to sort of get this right. But um, there are some platforms, IBM, has just put a, a text processing platform in the cloud that they're very proud of. Um, th I know that, um, what's that, what's that um, uh, business insights platform, Plateau? Uh, is it Plateau? Tableau. 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 Yeah. Yes, I, yeah. Um, uh, does some of this now, it has modules for that. So um, all of these things can be integrated, but it's really hard. Um, so the clustering will help you with statistical power to get to something even if you only have a few thousand people. Sorry, that was way more than anybody wanted to know about this, but now you do. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. So one at the back and this lady at the front. We'll have to limit it to one, I'm afraid. We've got two minutes one. to get to oh. the room. Okay, I'm sorry. My name is Friso Metz and I have a question for you, uh, Nathalie. Um, we heard about uh, six principles from uh, Robert Cialdini and uh, as I'm also a user of the internet, I can recognize many of them uh, since I have read his book. But uh, now I'm wondering, uh, for example, for booking this uh, trip to London, I had to book a plane and a hotel. Mm. And as I do that quite frequent, I, uh, I get a bit bored of the statement saying that there's only free uh, seats <laughs> or uh, rooms available in this price yeah. category, etc. So I'm just wondering if uh, all this, this kind of uh, influence, uh, isn't it uh, going to wear out uh, as people start to understand that they are trying to be influenced? There's mixed research um, in response to that. So in a lot of Cialdini's work, what, one of the, the threads that seems to go throughout is that even when people know about certain influence principles, unless you implement an if-then strategy to deal with them, so for instance, let's say reciprocity, I'm coming out of the tube and a Jehovah's Witness wants to give me something so that I pay them something, for instance. So I know, if in my mind, if I expect this situation to arise, I can say, if this happens, I will put both my hands in my pocket so I can't physically grab the book, right? So it's an if-then. Um, so if you know the principles and then you implement this strategy, which has proven to be very effective, then you can mitigate the effects. You'd be less susceptible to being influenced. Um, however, most of us are not going to do that. Um, and research tends to suggest that we're still susceptible even when we know what's going on. On the other side, uh, when you see a lot of people using these practices, adopting these practices, it's only a while before it becomes best practice and then it becomes ubiquitous. So you could say, okay, well, if three companies are doing it and all the rest aren't, they've got a competitive advantage. But as soon as you start booking frequently or everyone else starts to adopt it too, then there is you can speculate and say, well, actually, you'll stop becoming as sensitized to it with the whole idea of, you know, hedonic adaptation. But I've not seen it in process for long enough to say either way. Um, I do know that in the Netherlands, booking.com came under quite a lot of fire for using too many persuasion principles on their site. Um, so there is, again, the ethics question that comes in as to how and to, with, to what extent we can use these things. Um, so I haven't really answered your question. I think we need more time to see exactly what happens. Right. 
Um, thank you very much for your attention. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.